had you improved at all from the person that you were before you left? I, let's remove the, the wartime experiences right. aside. You were sort of looking for yourself when you went there. You, yeah. you had things about yourself that you didn't like. You wanted to change. You were hoping this would do it for you or at least contribute to it. Mm. Did it? I think that it was paramount in beginning that process because when I went over there, sorry, when I went over there, it changed my perspective on America. It changed my perspective on life. Like I had such an appreciation for the country I was going back to. I don't care who's the president. I don't care what the situation is. This is still, you know, the greatest country and it's a privilege to be able to live here and you know the the people there amazing people and when they get around americans to the point that they can uh connect with us all they want to do is leave you know specifically talking about afghanistan but the people that they experience being around us and it's like wow there's a difference and these are not like we're not talking about missionaries. We're talking about soldiers who are there doing a job who are very aware that, like, I may have to shoot you in the next 10 seconds. But even that person from America, when they when they connected with them, it was, it was so impactful that they wanted to come to America mm. because of how difficult their life is there. And, you know, so that, that gave me such an appreciation for this country. And so when you come back here, it's like I have a completely different perspective. And that started that process of, you know, me not becoming, me not being such a big deal. And, um, you know, I, I, I came home and wanted to, like I said, I wanted to be that guy. You know, I wanted to be the dad and the husband. And a lot of that was then polluted with, you know, just the trauma. And, but thankfully, my family loved me and I have so many. Um, other people in the military that came home to different experiences, you know, to came home with their bank accounts cleaned out by their girlfriend and they don't, they come home with nothing, you know, and different, you had a, you, you can imagine the gamut of experience when a, you know, a thousand people come home from deployment. But for me to have my family who loved me, supported me, even though I, uh, you know, like my, my family, my parents and stuff, they didn't know what was going on, but my wife knew that and she didn't know the full details of what was going on before I left, but she knew our marriage wasn't great. But she still, when I came home, she's very loving, very supportive. I mean, because it was hard for me to just be in public. Yeah. You know. It's incredible that she hung in there. Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, she didn't just hang in there. Like, she was in the she was a flower that was blossoming while I was gone. So that kind of tells you, you know, how rough it was for me being there and, you know, being um, in control of the narrative, I guess, of our family, yeah. you know, as the father. So it was, yeah, it was, it was big for both of us. So um, I had a friend that was uh, in the military and he went and had a tour or two in Iraq mm -hmm. before Afghanistan. And he had heard how uh, Afghanistan was and wanted to go there and wanted to do a tour there. And then when he got there, he wanted to leave because he said it was scary. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I imprint, you know, sort of uh, just throw you right into that scene. I imagine, you know, it was the same for everyone that was in Afghanistan at that time. Um, you know, I mean, I have to go back to your your family, your, you know, did you have moments when you're sitting there and you're thinking, man, you know, you're thinking back on your life going, I was a race car driver. My dad had this, my family had this business and how did I get here? How am I, how did I, how did I end up in this? I never thought that. Terrified. You never. I was so into what I was doing Yeah. that I, I, I never like that. You were never going to drag me back to the chicken farm. Yeah. Okay. I knew that. And I was so done with racing. Yeah. Like I never, it wasn't like, I guess not that you were missing any of those things, but like, I was proud to be there. Yeah. It, even though it was a terrible situation. And even though it was, were you, you ever, did anything ever happen over there that, that 
terrified the shit out of you. Oh, yeah. Right? So yeah. though even in those moments, it didn't break your spirit. No. Um, there's, there's several times that I should have been killed. And in, it's crazy. Like, in those moments, it's the same kind of, like, justification, you know, mm -hmm. like that we were talking about earlier. But in those moments, like, it's not going to happen, you know? Like, it's not going to happen to me. I mean, I, I've got, we, we got in a firefight and, uh, I mean, we, <laughs> the gunner on the hum, Humvee was filming. We had two cameras going. And at that point that was all kind of very, obviously very new. So, uh, but there's like, and when I'm in that moment, I think back when I was in that moment and I was shooting, you know, back at the enemy and they were firing at us. Like I remember very well that in that moment, like I, you know, when, when it's close, like when you're getting, when, when the bullets are coming close, it has a distinct sound over when it's not, you know? And I was judging that and I could tell, okay, it wasn't close. When I go back and watch that video, the, the Humvee that I'm standing behind is getting hit with bullets. It's got bullet holes. And that afterwards I was like, Hmm, I wonder where those came from. In the moment I had no idea that I was that close yeah. to getting shot, you know? And How can you watch all that stuff back? Uh, you just, it's just like, I don't know. It's like just part of the narrative. You know, you're like, I look back with that, uh, you know, th thankfully nobody in my platoon was killed. Um, it was only the bad guys were killed in the, in the engagements that I was in. There was people that were close to me that, um, you know, were killed and different, interactions with that world you know people being killed so you know i didn't have to directly deal with somebody close to me dying so it was more of like i escaped another moment where you know i should have been killed i mean there's a lot of times that i should have been hurt in a race car that i wasn't so yeah. you know there was a consistent kind of like well that happened but it didn't happen to me so you know i just keep on marching on and part of that too is like you have to kind of be there mentally. Like you can't really assess the risk of what you're doing when you're in that combat zone and you're, you know, actively engaged with an enemy. Like you can't really assess what's happening. Cause if you really assess what was happening, you would like, you would just be thinking about nothing but the fact that you're in danger. Yeah. Going to die. So right. like that can't even, that side of your brain never even just functions. like racing. Yeah. Well, not just like racing, but, but similar. Similar in a yeah. sense of like if you thought, man, this is dangerous and I could die before the race. So what would your lap time look like? It would not be good. Mm. Right. Yeah. Same thing. You turn that part of your brain off and mm -hmm. you get out there, I got a job to do. I'm going to do my job. If I get killed, I got killed. I mean, that's how you had to operate or else you would not. You, there's no way you could do your job. Yeah. If you're. But I just got to feel like that that. Damn, I don't know how. Because like. In a race car, there's so much around you that would tell you you're safe as hell. But in a combat zone, like you say, you could pick out your HUD and and be shot immediately. Yeah. Um, and driving around, I wouldn't want to. I don't know how you had the courage to even get in a Humvee and leave your base or where you, your encampment. I don't. I can't even imagine that that type of courage. It yeah, doesn't. I mean, it seems un, un, yeah, unhuman. It, it's because you have. Everybody, you know, all of the guys I was with, they, that's what they signed up to do, you know. Yeah. Like, and, and everybody dealt with combat. That, that's the one thing. It's, like, it's one thing to be in the country. It's another thing to be in combat. Because I had guys who cowered up, you know, like a child and was in the fetal position in the bottom of the floor of the Humvee. And I had guys that standing on top of the – gun turret you know completely wow. exposed yeah. and what's what's the difference you know on paper this guy was a better soldier but in combat that's the guy you want with you you know and it has that effect on people when you get into a life or death situation people respond differently sure. and, and they don't always respond you know did you did you know how you would respond or do you have to I just go in there and I find felt out? like I feel like I've always, when I've been put in situations like that, not necessarily life or death situations, but situations that are dangerous, I've always been very, uh, 
calm and uh, always been able to make decisions, not freeze up and continue, you know, whatever it is I'm supposed to be doing. And then kind of after the fact, go back and go, oh, that was kind of mm. that was kind of rough. How did the firefight start for your in your experience? Did did it? Was it a mission that you guys engaged in, or yep. was there, you know, was there ever ambushes? Like, how did it start? Well, this particular one is something that the uh, American see. We had what they called ETTs or embedded training teams. So we had Americans who were embedded with the Afghan police or the Afghan army, and they were training them to help protect their country. It's been going on for the last ten years, mm-hmm. you know. So part of their job as embedded trainers was to take these guys, you take them on missions and movement to contact and let's go get the bad guys kind of stuff. So my group were the SEC4 or the security force for the whole region of Herat, which is like the northwestern part of Afghanistan. And we would do different jobs. We would uh, do personal security details where we would take you know our senior leadership around the country and do different things uh we had guys that were security force gunners on missions with embedded trainers we would do convoy escorts we would just kind of do we'd run the gate at the compound so we kind of had all these different jobs that we would do as security force so one of them was to support this embedded training team who was doing this mission movement to contact to go get a bad guy Mm. so sunrise mission we had trained. Uh, we jumped in with those guys. They've been training for a month to do this. We jumped in with them with about a week to go, and uh, we're, I was a driver, and my guys were driver gunner on some of the American vehicles, and we were rolling with the Afghan vehicles in their trucks. And so, uh, you know, space gun movement to contact. We're going to this hut compound, or we're going to get the bad guy. Well, we pull up. You know, everything goes great. We get to the right to uh, pull up to the building. It's the wrong building. So our, the interpreter is freaking out, like, no, 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 no. Like They had done un- unbelievable amounts of intel on this being the spot, and it wasn't. And so the interpreter is like, no, 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 this isn't it, this isn't it. I mean, it's all that military dollars spent to, to do this mission, and the interpreter is the one who's telling us that, oh, this is not where the bad guys are. You know, they're up there. So anyway, chaos ensues, and uh, I'm in the lead vehicle, driving a uh, captain who is the the guy that's in charge of the embedded trainers and he's going to be boots on the ground going into the building we pull up and uh turn around i get out start pulling security turn around like i'm the only american vehicle my guys where that original compound was there's like 14 foot mud walls on both sides so they can't see anything they're blocked in by the afghan police and i had gone ahead with uh, with our U.S. forces, which was us in the vehicle, and pulled up, and what where we stopped over here is the building, and so we're, we're I get out, we're pulling security, trying to get all of our guys to come up here so we can all be up where we're supposed to be, and then gunfire, and like gunfire from uh, it was crazy. There was a moment there where I just looked up and I'm like, there's a canopy of like tracer fire going over my vehicle, over the, it was just like, I'm like, it almost looked like fireworks, you know, like it's just all tracer fire, which, you know, tracer round is like, it burns in the air as the bullet's going through. So it takes a lot of rounds to make a somewhat of a canopy mm-hmm. <clears throat> of fire. So I'm standing outside pulling security and, and that, that's when it all kicked off, you know? And so at that moment is when like my guys on the radio like it just was chaos, you know. People were screaming, hollering, yelling, and like, and I it was kind of one of those moments of clarity. But I got on there, I was like, in this in this tone that I'm talking to you right now, I was like, whatever their call sign was, listen, my call sign is up here by myself. I need you to un mess up y'all's vehicles and get to me right now. I'm 300 meters to your north get here because we're under fire and so they started getting the afghans out of the way anyway there's a moment there where where it's just us in this vehicle taking fire returning fire there's a there's a machine gun on top of that building the compound firing at us and uh, we're trying to hold our own anyway it felt like 
to 20 minutes. So it was probably about more like a minute or mm -hmm. a minute and a half. Our guys got there. We started returning fire, getting fire superiority, and then started the, <clears throat> the boots on ground of going in there and, and taking out the bad guys. Mm. So when, how, does, how does your tour wrap up? Like it ends? Yeah, so. You're sent home? Yep, end of May. And your contract with the military, how much time is left in that? So, I mean, I, I signed up for another year when I signed up when, before we deployed. So I was at the end again. And so now you're home, your contract's done with the military. Yep. Are you re up? Going to re up. Yep. What for? I just, I loved it. It's what you're, it's who you are. Yeah. Because, you know, for me and, and Mike sitting here who's never been in the military and never thought that we're going to go sign up tomorrow, you know, you chose to go um, serve your country, but you become, that's who you, that you become that person. Yeah, a little bit of career kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. And so now you're going to re-up again. What's going to, what is your thoughts of what is, what is that next uh, contract entail, right? What do you think you're going to experience? Are you going back? Well, I've. I felt like at, at this point that it was probably a small chance that I would go back. Why? Uh, just the way the rotation is working out. I was the last group to do a full 12 month rotation. So we had a, actually while we were there, there was a, they had a kind of a spike in guys in Iraq had to stay 15 months act, active duty. Um, but I think they had – by the time the end of my deployment came, they had kind of recovered some of the troop strength, and they started spacing out the deployments again. So I, I kind of hedged my bet a little bit and figured that I wouldn't be going again. And I loved it. And I had just come off that deployment, and I, my contract was up, and it was like, what are you going to do? And part of me wanted to just, like, walk away. You know, you did what you kind of signed up to do. But the other part of me is like, hey, I, at this point, I'm – I've moved up in rank. I'm in charge of guys, you know, and uh, I can't leave them. Mm -hmm. I want to. I want to still be there for them and keep doing what I'm doing. And you know, it, it was. I guess at that point, it was the prime of my military career because I I was up in responsibility. I was I had made rank, and I was still enlisted. I didn't go the officer route, so I was really boots on ground training guys and and having the ability to impact their life. Mm -hmm you know, and be a part of their life. So that that to me was a big deal, especially after you go through a deployment together. You know, I mean, it's true, and it's, it's true from what you see in movies and different things about what the happens to guys who go through an experience like that. I don't, you know, my experience, and traumatic as it was, was nothing like World War II, Vietnam. You know, uh, there's guys who have had similar experiences, but at the end of the day, it it's they're completely different you know, each one of those wars, uh, not to minimize Afghanistan or Iraq, but it is, it is when you look, just look at sheer numbers of people that were killed, it's a different war, you know, that those guys went through. So I, I still felt a tremendous loyalty to the guys that I was with. Uh, and I was close enough to that deployment experience that I didn't really know how to transition out of that probably. And probably felt more loyalty to those guys than even my family because of how, you know, that experience I'd just yeah, been through. Right. So, you know, I didn't come home thinking, I came home thinking I want to be that guy, the dad and the husband, but not able to see that that is probably the best path for me coming off being gone for 15 months, you know? Sure. So, do you realize that you have um, accomplished your goal of, um, doing something greater with your life after your frustrations with how your racing career ended? I do. I mean, I did. I definitely felt like. Fulfilled? Yeah. I felt like I had served my country. I felt like I did my part. You know, you, I didn't, I didn't just train. Yeah, but you, you, your accomplishments, like you just mentioned, you said, you, I mean, I'm in, I'm, I'm in my prime. I'm in this position where I'm, I have this responsibility and, and I'm over, I'm over this group of men. And like, I don't think you were probably ever imagining seeing yourself get to that point when you went to sign up for basic training. Yeah. Right. And so you've far exceeded expectation. Right. And made that time, you know, made that 
Xfinity career that was actually this really cool big thing, very small. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you feel that? I think so. I mean, I think I have an appreciation for it. I think I had an appreci- appreciation for it at the time, but it was never enough. <laughs> you know, like, okay, yeah, you did that. You yeah. did a good job. You did your job well, you know, but okay, what's next, guys? Sure. What's our next, okay. you know? I I was too a little too committed to the mission than I, than I was at, at 30 years old or, mm-hmm. you know, I was a little too, I turned 30 in Afghanistan, so I was a little too committed to being the sergeant that I'm supposed to be that I was able to reflect and say, this is greater than that, or, you know, you accomplished what you were, what you set out to accomplish, so now you should actually think about being a dad, you know, like, I, I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to really get there, Yeah. you know, like, I was still too, a little too, um, you know, just committed to that being that soldier guy so you signed up for another contract and what did you do during that contract mostly in the military side of things really for the next several years is just trying we just trained you know just train 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 and near home yeah or you know we would travel i think we went to saudi one time uh, oh. for like three weeks uh that was kind of, i think that was actually the last thing i did in uniform was go to saudi and uh, so yeah but most of it was most of it was training. And how does how does your career end with the military? I stepped off the plane, coming back at the end of your contract. Yep, I still had no. I was, I think that was. Uh, I think I had three months before my contract ended, but I stepped off the plane and I was like, and they knew it. I mean, I'd already told them like, hey, this is my last hurrah. When I get stuff off that plane, I'm not shaving or cutting my hair hmm. for You're, a year. Mm-hmm. What year so, was this? This is 2011. So 2011 mm-hmm. is your last year. Yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, you're the only one that we have to ask. It's kind of what this is about. Did you, did you ever imagine that the war in Afghanistan would go on as long as it did? And did all these experiences that you had over there evoke a feeling on the way it ended, which was recently? Yeah, absolutely. You, here's the interesting thing about Afghanistan, like, and it, why it's so different from Iraq. Iraq has infrastructure. It has assets. It has things that can be used for profit, oil, you know, resources. Afghanistan does not. Afghanistan has one paved road that goes around the whole country. You know, we went to villages that didn't know Russia occupied Afghanistan. Russia occupied Afghanistan for 10 years. Then we occupied for 10 years. And then we we went to the village to meet with them, and they were like, we had – we didn't know. This is the first we've known. So there's a huge disconnect – in an average Afghan person and being an Afghani. Mm. Like, we have such a sense of, I'm an American, you know, I fight for my country. They live day to day, and they're about, you know, surviving and about their village and about the their structure, which is a different structure than our structure. So, you know, it's like you're over there experiencing that, trying to get them to see that there might be a better way, and that's not necessarily what they want. Mm. They don't know to want it. Right. And and what I was saying earlier is that when they got to know that our life was way different than us boots on the ground in Afghanistan, our life in America was substantially better. And and the guys and the late whoever we interacted with, if they ever figured that out or got to know us to know that we're not the bad people that they make us out to be, then then all they want to do is go see that. Yeah. So you take everybody who is pro-American, and they want to leave the country. So it's it's hard to reconcile that, you know. It's hard to it's hard to say, hey, take that American feeling that you're feeling about how great it is, you know, that and that unity and the thing that you see in us, and apply it to your country. Well, nobody else, you know, wants to do that, you know. So Afghanistan's. I always felt like that. There had to become. There had to be an end. There had to be an end date on when we left the country. But how we left is almost as important as when we left. And um, you know, I didn't dive deep into how that happened. I I caught bits and pieces of it, but it sounded like that that was about the worst way that it could happen. 
the way that, and I know that they, there was no expectation that things would unfold the way they did, how fast they did. Uh, but, you know, it left me at this point in my life, it left me just heartbroken for those people mm. because there are, you know, they, those, those people there have the same value as far as life as me, you know, they're just as valuable and, um, what they are facing from, you know, government structure to whatever their life, the forecast or the, to look at their life in the future is it's sad you know it's really it's really sad were you surprised going seeing what you have seen were you surprised that the taliban was able to take control of Afga- afghanistan as quickly as they did no but, but i mean because you were even part of the training of the forces there i saw it firsthand i mean the, those guys it, it goes back to that sense of at the, you know if you and i are serving together. There's a sense of, yeah, you, we may not be on the same page, but you're going to do your part or attempt to do your part to serve your country, you know, because you're an American. So you should, there, that does not exist. They can, they could, you know, take it or leave it as far as being an Afghan and fighting for their country. And if I'm going to get shot, nah, you know, I mean, they, it's just, it's a, it's, you can't explain the difference in culture. Mm -hmm. You know, what little bit we know about it and a little bit we've experienced it is, it's just hard to put it. People, you're just not going to communicate that to the, why would they drop their weapons? Cause that's not something I would do. It's not something the normal American would do, you know, but that's not those, they, that culture does not think that way. And so you're, you're having, everybody's disappointed. I can't believe they didn't. Yeah, but, I mean, if you've been around that culture, you know that that's an absolutely normal response. You know, like there's just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die to try to save what, you know? Mm. It just, it, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's very dis, disheartening from the standpoint of, is it going to affect us day to day? No, but those people, and having a chance at a life, you know, women being able to educate kids, kids being able to grow up with some sort of sense of education and better themselves, you know, that's almost eliminated now. And that's heartbreaking. What do we have wrong over here that we, that, that we think we know about Afghanistan or the Taliban or it? it uh, what, what do we what what does uh, what infuriates you about the things that we think we know but we don't? Well, I mean, I think it's just it's hard to communicate what life is like in a country like Afghanistan until you've seen life lived there. You know, like it's hard to say, oh, it's a desperate situation. Oh, the the women are oppressed. I mean, I saw Afghan people put their daughter outside in the winter and bring the donkey inside. God. That's the synopsis right there of where the value system is in that country. I saw it, you know, like it wasn't no, like, Hey, I heard, no, I watched it happen, you know? And you're like, what, you know, but so how do you, you know what I mean? Like, it's almost like you can't really communicate the difference in America or Western civil, however you want to categorize, let's just take America. You can't, it's, you just can't like, and that wasn't, that was, you know, 2007, eight, that wasn't, but though, like I said, they didn't know Russia was there. There's places that didn't know Russia was there. So they're still living under the same structure, culture that's been there for hundreds of years, you know, same rules system, same value system, you know, and so, that that's not that's not changing, yeah. and it, it did. The truth is, it we did not have the um, impact that we wanted to have there, because I feel like the people that got to understand what we live in are the people that did not want to live in Afghanistan anymore, and you can't blame them because they've been living around this culture their whole lives and going, oh, this is miserable, and you're telling me that there's a place that I don't have to worry about, you know getting my head chopped off or being, you know, oppressed as a woman. I, I can like walk down the street without a head covering demanded by some man. 
you know, that some of that is cultural, but it's also like, yeah, that's that's the way we live over here. And that how do you know, the normal person here has no appreciation for that because that's the way we live everyday life. I guess that's why I, I'm so impressed by your ability to come back and be and acclimate over time back to this. You know, first of all, I can appreciate that you appreciate when, you know being over here, but getting back, you know, but but that's no that's no easy transition from seeing that to to living in and uh, I just I, I guess I understand why you would have taken some time to have to you know normalize yourself, but also I kind of appreciate even more what you've had to endure on the back end of it. Now you had another military contract to probably feel that time. And so, and it wasn't with combat. So I guess that helped, but go now that you're back, how do you start repairing or, 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 or setting up this life that you now have now? Like how was that transition and how long did it take? So, uh, came back in May of 08. So really 09 and it was, you know, I, I tried to, you know, like I tried to be that guy, you know, that dad. At the same time, trying to get out of my military PTSD funk. You know, I was trying to, to like to grasp living what what it's like to live here again correctly. I was trying to do all that, and that kind of, you know, time. They say time heals all wounds. Time definitely helped in me acclimating and getting getting back to normal, because you know you just the, all those realities that you lived in aren't realities anymore. So that after enough time passes, you're able to you know to kind of transition out of that. But I was still like it wasn't. I don't know. It's probably like a year. You know, a year later that you know I'm kind of back to the guy that I was before I left. So, in a good way or a bad way. In a bad way. In a bad way. Yeah, the jerk, narcissistic <laughs> jerk who's cheating on his wife and a non-existent dad for with his kids. You came back to that guy. I did. What the hell. I went to Afghanistan to leave him, and uh, and that and that worked. How did you get better? How did what I get did better? What did you do? Um, I had through Melanie. I really had a, ra- a radical encounter with. God's love. Well, explain that. Um, so, let me. So, when we were racing, yeah, you were. Um, you appreciated God. Oh yeah, I said there was nothing about my life. If you if you had really known me, you know what I mean. Like sure. if we had really, if you'd really like, if I had let you, because I was the greatest person that lived a lie i knew you as god fearing oh yeah oh, you yeah. know um with the lights on yeah mm. you had a good yeah but you could you have an amazing oh i said i stood up on no, the no, no, no. stage and said you have a heart mm. you have a real heart yeah you're a, a great friend you're you're genuine you're real yeah you're you were all those things in 1998, 99, 2000 when we were running around. Yeah. Um, so I know that that ex- not no, that's not BS. But what was this epiphany? Well, I mean, I really think it came through Melanie, my yeah. wife. How? Uh, How in the uh, hell is she still? Yeah, I know she's the hero of all this. Holy shit! Yeah. She's- <laughs> Yeah, she really is. Like, uh, so I was really at the end of myself again. You know, here yeah. we are again. I hate, I hate the life that I'm living. Like, I did not want to be that guy. You know, you were hating yourself, right? Yeah. Not- like, I mean, I'm what a jerk. You know, like yeah. I'm not stupid. You know, I realized that I'm being a a deadbeat dad. That I'm being a poor husband. Like all that. There's a. Re- I, I didn't want to be that guy. Sure. You know, but at the same you time, thought you were having a blast. Yeah, at the same time, like I wanted what I wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, so th- so I created two people. You know, I created the guy that was trying to be the good dad, who you know 
kept up the appearances. And then I created the guy who was also doing what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was the, I was super compartmentalized so that the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was the greatest, you know, keeper of the cell phone, uh, you know, and the greatest, you know, you couldn't get me, you couldn't catch me. Sure. You know, and like I said, when Melanie would bring me something like, what is this? You know, and she'd walk away going, what? How is that? You know, because that, sure. that's the way I just, I just operated. You're you right know? back to that. Yeah. 2011, 2012. Yeah, 2000, actually it's 2000, 2000. Yeah. 2010 is when this really happened, when this all transformed, changed. So what happened? So she goes, uh, and so see, like while I was in Afghanistan, spiritually, she started thriving because mm -hmm. The big bad bear is not in there putting a, you know, cold blanket on everything, you know, because I didn't, I, I like, I didn't want to go to church. Sure. I went to church because you're supposed to go to church, you yeah. know, but there wasn't, there's was nothing real, anything real about it to me, you know. So she, she goes through uh, th this kind of flower blooming while I'm gone, come back, it's hell for a year. It's not hell for a year. It's hell for the back half of that year, whenever I kind of started turning back into that same guy, you know. So uh, she she goes and has this uh, – she goes away and leaves me with the kids, which I was mad that she left. And how many kids are we talking about at this at point? At this point, it's three. Okay. Three boys. Where is she going? She's going to this uh, conference mm -hmm. in Alabama. So uh, she goes there and has a – just like a, a, a radical encounter. You know, like um, f just feels something on the inside of her. You know, I would call it – you know, the presence of God, but she, she felt something that started like, I don't know what's happening, but I feel a peace and I feel something real that, you know, that is changing me from the inside out. That's what's happening to her at this thing that she went to. So she comes home and I'm sitting on the couch, you know, she's been gone for three days. I couldn't get in touch with her. You know, I'm super like, well, I'm aggravated. Like, why did you go? You know, like what, anyway, so she comes and sits beside me on the couch. I'm watching TV, and she's looking at me, you know. And she's looking at me like she's like I don't. I've never seen this look before, you know. A very warm. I shouldn't say I've never seen it before. I know what you mean. She glowed. It's, yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, since she looked at me like that, you know. So I'm like freaking out a little bit on the inside, like you know, because I've got this whole line of lies I'm living and I'm like am I getting ready to have to defend myself anyway so she's looking at me like it's just so in so much love you know and uh so I'm like hey what's going on and she just looks at me and she goes you look the way you used to look when I fell in love with you and I'm like I mean I'm really freaking out now on the inside I was like, okay. And she just looked at me again and she said, you, you smell the way you used to smell when I fell in love with you. And I'm like, at this point, I'm like freaked out, you know. And so like, I don't know what to do. From that, for the next week, she's just like not the same person. Like she's just loving me with this very genuine love that hasn't been in our house for a long time, if ever. And uh, so, like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the world looks like because no, there's no, there's no consequences anymore for me, like being a jerk. I don't have to come home and negotiate my way out of things and stuff. Like, she's like, I don't care. So what she had done at that point is she, she told God, if like, if I have to leave this man, I'm, I'm going to protect what's happened on the inside of me. Like, what's happened on the inside of me is so real, and I feel, I feel it so much that I'm willing to leave him in order to protect what's just happened to her. So that's what she said to God. Uh, so she comes home and starts loving me like this. <clears throat> so for a week, like this is happening. So uh, a week later, like what I don't realize is happening to me is like how this is affecting me. Like, the way that she's loving me is just starting to break me down. You know, like I'm starting to having, I'm start having feelings of the reality of who I am. Like, I feel like I was exposed to the condition of my own heart for the first time. Like I could see it. 
Like I could see kind of the, the person that I had allowed myself to become. And it just broke my heart, you know. And I think that, that was such an amazing picture of grace to me, of God being willing to allow me to see who I am and who I've allowed myself to become, you know, like by the choices I made, by the things I wanted, this is who I'd become. And, and that all happened because of her coming back and loving me that way. And uh, so that week went by and um, a lot of things happened. We actually went and met Hank and Wendy at the Great Wolf Lodge here. Oh, yeah. And I was in the middle of dealing with the truth of who I was. Like, I, I feel like I was in the middle of kind of like me dealing with myself, if that makes sense. And so when Hank and Wendy saw me, they were like, what is wrong with him to Melanie behind my back? You know, like, because I was just, I was so internally conflicted because I'm seeing this. Like, I started, I cried by myself for the first time in 10 years. Like, this is what, I, this is what's happening on the inside of me. Like, this is just, there's turmoil. Like, I, I thought maybe I need to leave, like, get away from this. Like, I'm, I want to. Like at that time I had property in Nebraska, like I'm going to move to Nebraska because I don't want to have to deal with what I'm dealing with of what's happening on the inside of me, you know? Anyway, so at the end of that week, we're back home from the Great Wolf Lodge and uh, we're we're sitting in bed and the whole time she'd been like, what's going on? You know, talk to me. She could tell like this guy's about to lose it, you know? And uh, so we, we hadn't talked and that night, you know, like I had felt this sense of the only way – I'm going to get on the other side of this is for her to come clean with her. Mm. That's the, that's the only path for me to be right mm. is to be right with her, mm. you know, like to confess, Hey, this is what you've, you know? So anyway, that was, that was what I was dealing with and wrestling with of, am I really going to be honest with her? You know? So that week later, if, what one week from the day from her coming home, we're laying in, in bed and she says, Hey, we, you know, we need to talk. And I said, I told her, I said, listen, I want to talk, but I don't think you're going to be here on the other side of this conversation. And she said to me, she said, she said, I may not be here, but there's freedom on the other side of this conversation. And, it, you know, it was in that moment, I was just like, I just broke. You know, I was like, I, I was so miserable that if that's true, like if you're, if what you're saying to me is true, if there's really freedom on the other side of this, I want that. I yeah. mean, that's how broken I was. That's how miserable with the life that I was living. That's how that's how miserable I was. Like if that's if what you're saying is real, I want that. So I started the process that night of confessing all the things that I was and everything that I had done and you know, I just unloaded it all. And um, you know, what What a picture of God's grace and love that she responded in love, you know, hurt, obviously, unbelievably hurt, you know, cried all night. What's funny and ironic is that after I told her, you know, everything that I could about told her the truth, I literally like, I don't know, this is probably like 1130 at night or something. But I, I like told her and like we talked a little bit longer and I like passed out asleep. But what's ironic is that I had been unable to sleep for years, you know, like just so caught up in the turmoil who I was. I mean, I would take an Ambien to go to sleep. I'd take another one at midnight to go back to sleep. I mean, just, you know, like, whoa, this guy is miserable yeah. and that night bam after that conversation I went to sleep and never had problems sleeping wow. after that it was that that's that's the kind of impact that had and that that love and that freedom but the next day you know we started the process of rebuilding our marriage and you know she at the in the beginning stages she was really such a huge part of that obviously but like and and like I, I was so I had never felt what that freedom had felt like, like real freedom, 
you know, like that kind of freedom. I'd, I'd never felt it. So I was almost giddy. I was kind of like punch drunk a little bit because I had been carrying the weight of all this for so long that when that weight was gone, like, yeah, I may be a jerk, but I'm not a liar anymore. You know, like this is, this is me. And something happened to me um, in that moment. Something happened in my heart. And I think I kind of experienced the same thing she experienced where I felt a freedom and I felt a peace that I had never felt before. And I knew that whatever I had to do, I wanted to protect that. And I, and I told her the next day, I was like, hey, if we need to get a divorce or if you want me to move out, like, I'll do that. You know, like, whatever I need to do, you tell me what I need to do. I want, I'd love for us to try to, you know, reconcile things. I know that, you know, it's, it may be too early to be yeah. talking about this, but at the end of the day, I know what's happened inside of me. And, you know, I would love for us to be able to try to reconcile things. And she said, you know, we're not going to talk to your parents. We're not going to talk to my parents. We're not going to talk to a counselor. You know, we're just going to, we're going to pray and we're going to get together. We're going to talk about it and we're going to see what happens. Mm. And I think a week later was Catfish's wedding. And we came up here. Tank Jr.'s brother. Yeah. yeah. So we came up here to go to that. And even Hank, because Hank Jr. had seen me, you know, in the midst of all that turmoil. So he's a week later when he sees me, he's like, what happened? You know, like I was so different that he noticed visually, like, this is a different person. He's yeah. like, what? He, he couldn't stop. What happened to you? You know, and I, you know, told him that same story. He's like, man, this is what happened. And like, we started that process of rebuilding our marriage in, in that moment. And, um, you know, it's, I mean, I, I literally, like, I could not have, it's the second greatest marriage I know of in the earth. <laughs> I mean, it's it's better than it's ever been. It consistently is getting better. Um, my relationship with my kids has um, is amazing. You know, there's no greater honor for me, there's no greater responsibility for me in the earth than being a dad. Like, if I can get that part right, the rest of it, I don't care, you know. But I, I, that I'm finally realizing, you know, what that means and have such an appreciation for it and feel like it's the one thing that's missing in the earth, you know, is real dads being dads. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got the – Hey, I really screwed that up part down, you know, and now I'm discovering uh, and have been discovering what it's like to, to be a dad and to be the husband that, you know, I've always wanted to be, you know. But here again, that being said, the hero in all this yeah. is Melanie. Oh, and you there know. ain't no denying that. I, yeah, I don't have to restate that. No, no, no. I like, <laughs> I like, I like, I like to make that clear. No, know? no, that's it's clear. Yeah. You want to talk about God's grace. It started the day Melanie came in your life. Yeah, that's that's where it started. You know what's funny? Like I can look back at that and go, there was something inside of me that same feeling, you know, that I felt that was there when I was around her. You know, like I would say, oh, I knew she was the one. Mm -hmm. But now I can look back and go, it was a little different that feeling, you know. And I think people have that. I'm not saying it's not that you, you have that same feeling with other people, but but now when I look back at at our our dating and our courting and all that kind of stuff, I'm like, whoa, like. You know, God was even in that. Yeah. You know, like I, I know that he was a part of that too. That's profound, man. I appreciate you being um, willing to share all that, you know, and you're probably getting something out of that, being able to share that um, for yourself. You know, you're probably, it's probably part of your process or whatever, you know, is telling those truths. But um, there's somebody that's listening to this that either is needing to hear this, you know, somebody that's that jerk. Yeah. That's that needs to know about that freedom you're talking about. Yeah. Um, because I think that um, a lot of us that put ourselves in that situation don't realize the freedoms on the other side that your wife mentioned. And we're fearful about what that means to the relationship and losing yeah. our wives and all that, you know, and, and, uh, I don't know, man. I think this will, you know, somebody's going to gain a bunch out of this. I bet more than one person will. 